to be here with the runner, your president, Mary Beth Cooper, and the, the campus looks absolutely wonderful. I apologize, um, as Mary Beth knows, when you're chasing money, I have a budgetary legislative uh, meeting that has been changed, uh, and I was supposed to be here about 11, 11.15, uh, but when you're chasing money, you always have to chase money, whether it's for the city or the college. So I wanted to come up, and I really wanted to drop the proclamation off, but they're so gracious to have me say a few words. And I have to uh, commend Smithfield College, again, uh, living up to your continued uh, uh, legacy, humanics and diversity, and celebrating it, each and every one of you and your staff and, and students. It's, it's very, very important. The world has changed, and it's changed for the better, and it's a about the respect you give is the respect that you get. And we have so many uh, talented individuals, no matter what creed, color, and background, that constantly give back. And just taking the time to be, to understand one another will make us a better Springfield, a better Commonwealth, a better nation, and a better world. And if people just took that time, I think it'd go a long way. So officially, we have a proclamation. Uh, whereas uh, Tom Waddell was born, uh, Thomas Flubacker, on November 1st, 1937 in Patterson, New Jersey, after Tom's parents separated, he was adopted by Jean and Hazel Waddell. Tom attended Springfield College on a track scholarship, so he was a runner too. While at Springfield College, he completed, uh, competed in gymnastics and the football teams. After a sudden death of his best friend and co-captain of the gymnastics team, an event uh, that deeply moved him, Tom switched his major from physical education to pre-medicine. Tom graduated from Springfield College in 1959 and later attended medical school at New Jersey College of Medicine. And whereas Tom also served his country, he was drafted into the Army in 1966, became a preventative medicine officer and paratrooper. Tom represented the United States in a decathlon in the 1968 Summer Olympics, and where he placed sixth and he was an infectious disease specialist and provided medical service for many years in Africa, Asia, Saudi Arabia, where he eventually became a team physician for the Saudi Arabian Olympic team at the 1976 Olympics. I hope I'm not being redundant, but I think it's important to put out what type of man Tom was. Tom was best known as the founder of the Gay Games that started in 1982, held every four years since. The Gay Games welcomes more than 8,000 athletes, regardless of sexual orientation, race, gender, identity, religion, sex, ethnic origin, athletic ability, and political beliefs from 47 countries to compete in an inclusive environment. And whereas Tom passed away on July 11, 1987, and truly lived the motto of Springfield College, Humanics and Diversity, today we honor and recognize the life of Tom Waddell and commemorate his humanitarian contributions, including the creation of the Gay Games. Therefore, I, Dominic J. Sarno, Mayor of the City of Springfield, do hereby proclaim Friday, April 17, 2015, as Tom Waddell Day in the great city of Springfield. I urge all our residents to recognize the sacrifices that Tom put forth for the betterment of our community. God rest his soul, and through Springfield College, his legacy lives on. Thank you so, so much. I'm gonna talk the mayor out as he's walking. Um, you know, the mayor called me yesterday and said he was going to stop by so that um, I, I knew I'd see him this morning. And a lesser man would, that got caught up in business and chasing money, um, would have sent this over or called and said that I was unable to be there. But he got in his car and came here to be a part of it. Uh, and I think that really tells me the character of our mayor, that this is important to Springfield College. and it was important enough for him to be here with us. And so I know he's now gone, uh, but I really appreciate him being here. And now we have a proclamation. And maybe some of the money he's chasing, we'll, we'll get some of that too. <laughs> so thank you, thank you for interrupting the program. Thank you so much, Mayor Sarno and President Cooper. We are now gonna continue with the program by hearing from Jeffrey Pike, who has come here 
from Boston. Uh, Jeffrey is an honorary lifetime member of the Federation of Gay Games, uh, having been a charter board member and serving 11 years on the board until 2001. He has been involved in LGBT sports in the Boston area since 1979, so it actually predates the gay games. Uh, his sports have included softball, volleyball, tennis, ice hockey, soccer. Uh, he served as the president of Team Boston for gay games two and three, and I believe will tell us a little bit about meeting Tom Waddell briefly in gay games two. Uh, and it's just a great honor for us to be partnered with an organization that meets us at the heart. So I present to you Jeffrey Pike. Thank you, Professor Dobrow, uh, for inviting the Federation of Gay Games to participate in Tom Waddell Day. I'm thrilled to be part of today's activities because of the impact the gay games have had on my life. I want to focus my words today on Tom's vision of the gay games, how the Federation of Gay Games carries forward this vision and the continued relevance of Tom's vision in, a world, in the world and in planning for Gay Games 10 in Paris, which is in 2018. Before I speak about those three topics, I want to say that I met Tom once for about 30 seconds. It was right before Gay Games 2 uh, in the main office of the San Francisco Arts and Athletics, um, the original organization for the games. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was distributing posters for the dance concert I had organized for Gay Games 2, and Tom zoomed in and out after giving instructions to the volunteers in the office. At the time, I didn't understand whom I had been introduced to. Two of my sources for books today are A Sense of Pride, The Story of the Gay Games, uh, by Roy Coe, who is the director of the communications of Gay Games at Two, and Gay Olympian, The Life and Death of Tom Waddell, uh, by Tom Waddell and Dick Schaff, who was a reporter for ABC News. We saw the piece by him, and he was a friend of Tom's. A third source uh, is a thin binder titled Original Transcripts of Gay Games, one, by Tom Waddell. This document was a gift to me from Sarah Lewinstein, uh, Tom's widow. She gave it to me several years after Tom's death when Sarah and I were serving together on the Federation of Gay Games board. She shared this document with me so I could hear Tom's voice above the noise of others who claimed to know Tom's words and intentions. Participation, inclusion, and personal best. These are the core values of the gay games. In, 19, uh, sorry, in 1980, at the San Francisco Cable Card Awards, Tom Waddell mentioned the idea of a gay Olympic games. Shortly after that, Tom, along with Mark Brown, who is seated on the left here, um, and Paul Mart, who is not in this picture, organized the first meeting to establish the United States Olympic, Gay Olympic Olympics Committee in June 15, 1980. Tom later, later wrote, quote, the Gay Games as conceived in 1980 and had an almost comic start. Since there were no international ties to the sports organization existing in the gay community, and since those organizations were generally functioning at, on local levels or were confined to gender exclusivity, there was an initial skepticism about the viability of the games. To many, it seemed an impossible and foolhardy undertaking. In the late 70s, many US cities, and unquote, in, Sorry, I'm a little nervous after, after that video. I'm like, oh my gosh, to see him again. Whew. All right. Uh, in the late 70s, many US cities had sports leagues. Boston actually had groups and leagues playing softball, bowling, volleyball, basketball, tennis, pool, and an outdoors club. But contact between groups was just beginning. Tom and his committee believed in their idea and persisted and insisted on building com community. They reached out across 
the US to publicize the event. Tom made sure that women were involved. It was during this process that Tom met his future wife, Sarah Lewinstein. As an organizer in the Boston area of sports at that time, I can attest to the challenges of making space for diversity in LGBT sports leagues. Quoting Tom again, uh, the principle that propelled the gay games one to reality was their core concept, the notion that the games are a vehicle for education and change regarding the perception of homosexuality by openly gay men and women. A clear, self, self, a clear sense of identity and self-esteem was a primary, primary objective. Athletically speaking, and this is quoting Tom again, athletically speaking, the objective of making participation and self-fulfillment the priority over the traditional concept of winning was continually stressed. To make winning the endpoint for success is to capitulate to the traditional destructive philosophy of competitive athletics. Winning, when made a priority, creates an adversary climate, and when winning becomes important, then it also makes losing important. Still quoting Tom, we wish to propagate the concept that doing one's personal best creates an entire field of winners and redefines the notion of excellence to encompass each individual's capabilities. When Tom described, what Tom described as a comic start to the gay games turned out to be a huge success. By the time closing ceremonies had ended at the gay games, it was clear the games, to quote Tom again, the games were a viable force towards positive action and unity for the global gay population. One of my roommates, a less than athletic man, participated in the first games. He returned home invigorated and telling stories about feeling as if being at the Olympics, a stadium filled of cheering crowds and meeting people from around the world. What really caught my attention though was his description of his finishing last in a road race. Rather than finish last and being unnoticed, he had received a standing ovation from the spectators who intentionally stayed to cheer every participant. My roommate's sense of himself as a person and as an athlete had changed for the positive. As I heard more similar stories about Gay Games 1, I enthusiastically started planning to participate in Gay Games 2. There is a significant story that goes along with Gay Games 1. The story involves the original name of the event and the US Olympic Committee. And the story is both negative has both negative and positive impacts on the games. Aware that the USOC controlled the use of the word Olympic, Olympics by a 1978 act of Congress, Tom had changed the umbrella organization for the games from United States Gay Olympic Committee to San Francisco Arts and Athletics, SFAA. But he wrote the USOC in December 1981 to request the use of the word Olympics to call his event the Gay Olympic Games. The conversation did not go well. Lawyers on both sides joined the conversation, as did Sports Illustrated, which mocked the USOC, thus validating the games and drawing mainstream media to the event. As Tom was quoted observing, quote, we've come across the Rat Olympics, the Crab Cooking Olympics, the Xerox Olympics, the Armenian Menian Olympics. The bottom line is that if I'm a rat, a crab, a copying machine, or an, Armeni or an Armenian, I can have my own Olympics. But if I'm gay, I can't. As the opening ceremony for gay, gay, gay Olympic Games one neared, the conversation stayed out of the courts. And the feeling was that the US, USOC would let the name stand. However, 19 days before the games began, the USOC obtained a federal court order blocking the use of the word Olympics or Olympiad in any way. 
San Francisco Examiner columnist Bill Mandel wrote, quote, volunteers are busy scratching the word Olympics off thousands of tickets in the Gay Games office yesterday. The word is coming off medals, flags, banners, posters, and t-shirts. And one of those posters is at the back if you haven't seen it already. After, the games, after Gay Games 1 concluded, the court battle escalated. Ultimately, on June 25th, 1987, the Supreme Court ruled 5-4 in favor of the USOC. In addition, a lien was put on Tom Waddell's home to pay the USOC lawyers' fees. Two weeks after the Supreme Court decision, Tom died due to complications of AIDS. The following week, the USOC dropped the lien on Tom's home. Sorry, I can't see all of my own notes here. There you go. The USC's adversarial relationship with the gay games slowly reversed. In the early 90s, the executive board of the Federation of Gay Games accepted an invitation to Colorado Springs, the USOC training facility for meetings to mend the relationship, which today is quite positive. Another quote from Tom, the gay games are not separatist. They are not exclusive. They are not oriented to victory and they are not for commercial gain. They are, however, intended to bring a global community together in friendship, to experience participation, to elevate consciousness and self-esteem and to achieve a form of cultural and intellectual synergy. And now, just a little bit about the transition to becoming the Federation of Gay Games. The first step to internationalizing the games was to pass the torch to Vancouver to host Gay Games 3 in 1990. The second step was to transform San Francisco Arts and Athletics into a governing body that brought together LGBT leaders from around the globe. The transformation happened in July 1989 San Francisco Arts and Athletic leadership identified and invited leaders who had attended either Gay Games 1 or Gay Games 2 and demonstrated leadership in, for city teams, sports, and or cultural disciplines. I was selected both for, <clears throat> excuse me, both for serving as president of Team Boston and for organizing dance performances for Gay Games 2. In the course of the meetings, we invited we, the invited guests, were voted onto the San Francisco Arts and Athletics Board, and then as a body, we renamed the organization to Federation of Gay Games and began the work on new bylaws and a governing structure, all while continuing to share institutional knowledge about the event with Vancouver, the next host. There were and are many challenges to being an international organization built on volunteers, communicating across uh, time zones, different languages, cultural norms, institutional prejudices, just to name a few. Keeping volunteers motivated and on deadlines takes a new twist when a committee is dispersed around the globe. The Federation has grown and adapted um, to best manage these challenges, and there have been nine gay games since, uh, thus far, excuse me. Here are logos from those nine events uh, starting in the upper left corner, that's Gay Games 1 going across, Gay Games 2, Game, Gay Games 3 is the upper right, that's Vancouver, New York is in the middle on the left, Amsterdam Center, Paul Lind Block, for those who know Hollywood Squares, um, uh, Gay Games 6 in Sydney, um, then on the bottom row, Chicago, Cologne, and Cleveland, Akron, where the, the games just were completed this past year. There are a lot of um, big um, media, um, th there's a lot that comes out in the media about the numbers that have participated, how big the stadium was, um, the stars who were there, but what continues to be the important thing about the gay games is the individual stories, what people achieve. Uh, pictured in front of you now is 99-year-old 90, Ida Keeling, who set the world record in the 100-meter race at, in Cleveland uh, she was running alongside her 63-year-old daughter, Shelley. 